situation in Venezuela has been very precarious, uh, but more recently, even more so. Uh, the recent um, statement by John Bolton about the axis of evil, it consists of Venezuela, Nicaragua, and Cuba, um, just there's an escalation of discourse, an escalation of the narrative, but also an escalation of the actions. Uh, just think of uh, Obama's actions against Venezuela in the form of an executive decree that stated that Venezuela was an extraordinary and unusual threat to U.S. national security. That was issued in 2015. It was reissued by Obama a year later and now issued, reissued by, uh, by Trump. But now the economic sanctions against Venezuela means that the rhetoric is being escalated, but also the actions are being escalated. Um, the um, Trump administration <coughs> states that Venezuela is a dictatorship. The only way to justify these sanctions and the only way to justify possible military action, which uh, uh, Trump has stated is an option, it's on the table, uh, and has also encouraged the Venezuelan military to overthrow uh, President Maduro. Next to President Duque of Colombia, Trump said a military coup against uh, Maduro would succeed. Well, in effect, that's saying that a military coup or that military coup leaders can count on U.S. support. The only way that can be justified is not by talking about the economic crisis, because if that was the criteria for military intervention, then the United States would be, would be intervening all over the place, which in fact it does, at least in the Middle East. But it would be even worse. I mean, you know, so it would be intervening in Central America and Africa all over the place. Um, so that the typical narrative of the Trump administration and the Venezuelan opposition and much of the media, the corporate media, is conflating talk of the humanitarian crisis in Venezuela, the difficult economic situation, which although is sometimes exaggerated, not by much, because the situation in Venezuela is very difficult. And nobody denies that. They conflate that with the state of Venezuelan democracy, that there's no democracy, that uh, Maduro is a dictator, and that there is a constant violation of human rights. So the question is, why, if the part about the economic crisis is true, why do they have to lie? Or why do they have to exaggerate? Why do they have to cherry pick when it comes to Venezuelan democracy? Well, it's just that. If it's just about economics, you can't justify sanctions. You can't justify military action. Uh, but by conflating the two, they confuse people because they say something that's basically true, that the economic situation is difficult, and then they insert the part about democracy quickly. And if somebody isn't analytical, if they're not really you know, analyzing the message, they kind of assume that the part, if the part about democracy is true, then what they're saying about dictatorship and violation of human rights must also be true. Um, but they're, they're, the fallacy of the statement that Venezuela is not democratic can easily be pointed out. Um, firstly, James Carter and his Carter Center have observed over 90 elections throughout the world. Carter stated that of these 90 plus elections, that Venezuela has the best electoral system. And there's no question about it, because the Venezuelan system, unlike the United States that is being highly questioned now because of um, you know, possibilities of hacking and fraud, et cetera, uh, 
the Venezuelan system is a dual system. It's and 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 I have I have voted. I'm uh, a resident in Venezuela. I'm a U.S. citizen, but I'm a resident in Venezuela, and I have the right to vote in municipal elections. And now, with the Constitution of 1999, in state elections, I can't vote at the national level. Um, and I'll tell you how it works. You go in there, and you vote electronically, and a pa paper ballot comes out with the candidates that you voted for. You look at that, at that, uh, that paper ballot, and if, that's, if those are the people that you voted for, you sign it and you put it in the ballot box. If there's any discrepancy, well, that will be reported. But that's never the case. So, um, you know, if there's hacking, or if there's, you know, messing around with codes, it's going to come out. The voter is going to see with his or her own eyes that these aren't the people that they voted for. And there is an auditing process of almost 50% of the, elect of, the, of the voting centers. The opposition is there as observers as they have a right to be. And there's never any objection. They sign the document stating that, you know, everything was in order. So the opposition sometimes, not often, but sometimes they talk about electoral fraud. But their definition of electoral fraud is different than mine, which is okay because you can de define a word, you know, uh, however you like. My definition of electoral fraud is with regard to uh, the counting of votes. If there are discrepancies, if the final tally doesn't represent the way people voted, that's electoral fraud, and that country can be considered non-democratic. When the opposition, the few times that they use the term electoral fraud, they're, they're refer, referring to something else. They're referring to, for instance, that you don't have an even, you don't have a, a, a level playing field because the national television channel, the government television channel, which is supposed to run so many ads for the opposition candidates, run less ads or there's less time than what the Electoral Council uh, ha has ordered. That may be true or may be false. I don't know. But even if it's true, that's not electoral fraud. That means that there are certain, there are certain shortcomings in the system. OK. In the worst of cases, I'm not saying that it's true, but even if it were true, Look at the United States system. I don't have to even go into that. Gerrymandering, voter suppression. Um, not, only, not only two of the last three presidential candidates who have won elections with less votes, Bush in 2000 and Trump in 2016. Although if you count the uh, undocumented immigrants that voted in 2016, Trump actually got more votes than... Uh, than Hillary Clinton. I'm only kidding. Uh, but um, not only that, but you know, in national elections uh, for Congress, the Democrats almost always win. I mean, the Democrats almost always get more popular votes. And yet, look at Trump up until yesterday controlled both, part, both houses of Congress, the Supreme Court, and of course the executive. So there are fallacies, there are shortcomings in all electoral systems. Um, nothing's perfect, and, and OK, you can point that out. But electoral fraud in Venezuela, there is no real evidence of that. Another thing that the opposition says is that um, there are cases of people voting twice. But they talked about that with regard to the elections in November of 2017, the gubernatorial elections. In those elections, the Chavistas won in all but five states. And in all of the states in which the Chavistas won, with one exception, they won by 10 or 15 percentage points different, difference. Now, you can't alter an election by sending two, two people, sending people out to vote two times or three times or four times. The opposition has enough resources. They're getting it from the United States. 
They're getting it from their own business class, which opposes the Chavista governments. They tried to overthrow Chavez twice, the Chamber of Commerce of Venezuela. They have enough resources. If, you know, they were sending people out to vote two, three, five, ten times, the opposition would be able to, you know, snap a couple of photographs or demonstrate uh, other in, 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 uh, through other means, and that would be in all the newspapers throughout the world. There was a student at a, a place that I talked at uh, in Canada at Thompson River University, a Venezuelan student, who said, when I voted, I saw somebody who I know who had passed away, and his name was down there in the book, and um, I saw the signature. I know from experience that when you're talking and somebody says something that you know is a lie, not to, to call him a liar. And I didn't, I didn't make any comment about in that respect, but I did say what I just said, that it's, that's not going to alter the results uh, when the difference is, you know, 15,000, 20,000, 50,000 votes, getting people to, sign, to, to vote uh, uh, um, in the name of somebody who's passed away is not going to alter the results. That, that's what I said. What I didn't say is that I don't believe what he said because I know how that works. Uh, you know, somebody cannot go in there and start examining the books with the names of the different voters and their signatures. I mean, you go in there and you sign. And the possibility that somebody that you know has their signature next to yours when you go to sign is one in 10,000. So, okay. Then the real question that comes up is how do you explain if this is a, if, there, you, if you don't have electoral fraud, how do you explain that the Chavistas have won all the elections since 1998, and there have been over 20, and the Chavistas have won all but two? They lost one. It was a referendum in 2007. They lost by one or two percentage points. Chavez immediately announced that the opposition won those elections. He was angry, but he announced that his people lost. And the second time was under Maduro in the elections for the General Assembly in 2015. So the Chavistas have won all the elections, except two. Now, you could talk about populism, you could talk about uh, demagoguery, and say a candidate can win an election once, by being a populist, but the second time, if they don't deliver, they're going to lose. I mean, that happened to, uh, for example, Alejandro Toledo. Uh, he was a, uh, he made more promises than he had to, and he won those elections. And then, you know, look what happened to him. His pop when I was in Peru, uh, the first time his popularity was down to eight percent, and the second time, people were were talking that his popularity had improved because it had reached double digits. It had gone from 8 to 10 percent. <laughs> so the, uh, uh, the, 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 the explanation that populism explains, or cheap populism explains uh, Chavez's ability to win elections so many times uh, doesn't cut ice. In order to understand that, uh, you have to go back to the period of neoliberalism in the 1990s. In the 1990s, uh, the, um, the government of Carlos Andres Perez and Rafael Caldera privatized. There was a massive privatization, as there was throughout Latin America. But unlike other countries in Latin America, in Venezuela, all the privatizations, practically without exception, went over to foreign capital. And, uh, you know, the state-owned steel company was bought out by an international uh, consortium, uh, Argentinian, by the way, uh, Argentinian controlled. Uh, the electricity company or companies, the, uh, 
the electricity company of Caracas was bought out by a U.S. company. The telephone uh, industry was bought by GTT, which was in turn bought by Verizon. So Verizon owned the Venezuelan telephone company. Um, the, and a number of other industries. Uh, uh, and companies that were owned by national capital, such as the cement company, which was owned by Eugenio Mendoza, who was the Rockefeller of, of Venezuela, the richest uh, person in Venezuela. He died in the 1980s, and I think in the late 1980s, if I remember correctly, uh, it was bought out by a Japanese firm and then C Cemex. Uh, Cemex, you know Cemex. Uh, they were the owners of the main cement company, Vincemos in Venezuela. The two most important, two of the most important banks in Venezuela, uh, El Banco Provincial, which I think might have been the biggest, was bought by Bilbao Vizcaya of Spain. The oldest bank, the Bank of Venezuela, Banco de Venezuela, was bought by Santander, also of, of Spain. Savoy, which was the pride of Venezuela. It was, you know, it was a, it's the chocolate company in Venezuela, uh, makes perhaps the best chocolate in the world. Uh, and it was a company that was founded by European immigrants that arrived in Venezuela around the end of World War II. Uh, well, that was bought out by Nestle. So you had, you know, industry by industry. The Venezuelan economy ceased to be Venezuela in the 1990s. And Chavez comes along with a nationalistic discourse which um, I told the, the class that I spoke in today at the, at the um, uh, Seattle Central uh, College. Uh, I realized that you know, there's cer you know, there's certain words which in Venezuela have different connotations. I used the word nationalistic. And then I thought, well, you know, here in the United States, people, nationalism, that's not necessarily good. But then I said, you know, now that Trump is calling himself a nationalist, uh, <laughs> The word is kosher and <laughs> shouldn't get anybody upset. So it, it, there was a sense of uh, economic nationalism that, uh, you know, the Venezuelan economy had been turned over to foreign capital. And that helps explain why an outsider like uh, Chavez won the elections, and not only an outsider, as opposed to one of the traditional parties that might have been you know, critical and expressing the discontent that existed in Venezuela, but a party that had been around and was more pro-establishment, Chavez was an outsider. He had spearheaded a coup that had failed. He went to jail for that for over two years, a little over two years. Um, and not only did Chavez win those elections, but the candidate that came in second place, uh, Enrique Salas Romer, um, also had an anti-party discourse. He was pro-establishment, but his discourse was anti-party, and he came in second place with about 38% of the vote. And in any size, who had been a Miss Universe uh, and became the mayor of one of the cities in Caracas, she was in first place in the beginning of the campaign until she uh, accepted the support of Cope, a traditional party. And then her support knows that. So there was a lot of discontent in Venezuela. And the people uh, in the opposition, and the opposition leaders who you might you know, hear on TV or read in, in the press, who say Venezuela was a nice place to live before Chavez came along. People lived well, hunky-dory. Everybody was content. And incidentally, part of that narrative is that we didn't have racism before Chavez came along. But Chavez used the, the racist card and has now divided people of color and people who, who, are, who are white. That never existed before. That discourse is blatantly false. The, the part about racism, I can recommend a book by Wright, W-R-I-G-H-T, uh, uh, Winthrop Wright. Um, Café con leche, it's called, um, café con leche means basically that Venezuelans are not, are, are a mixture of white, 
African American, and uh, there's also an indigenous component that uh, Chavez was, was quite pride of, uh, proud of, that he was part indigenous, part African, Venezuelan, and, and part European. But that, that, that's a myth, that racism didn't exist. As a matter of fact, I can say that one of the things that, um, when I arrived to Venezuela in the 70s, uh, there were a group of US PhD students and it's something we all picked up. I mean, I heard from all the, the students, boy, you know, Venezuelans, they, they're hesitant to go to the beach. They don't want to get tanned. No, seriously. And, and you know, since people in the United States are more sensitive to that issue, um, they'd always make that comment. You know, the Venezuelans say that there's no racism in Venezuela. Why, why, don't, why, don't, why do they think twice before going to the beach? That, that kind of thing. Uh, so racism, in more subtle form than, say, in the States, uh, but racism existed in Venezuela. And as far as uh, Venezuela being some kind of social, economic paradise, I mean, the, the election of Chavez as an outsider is a demonstration of the fact that there was a lot of discontent. Um, the second point that I want to go over very, very briefly is the system a severance payment. But we're here in a, in a hall, uh, a, a building of organized labor, and it's worth pointing out that in Venezuela, the system of severance payment has always been extremely important. It's a, it's a basic um, right. Everybody in Venezuela knows what prestaciones sociales means, which is the severance payment system based on your last salary, your last monthly salary. Well, that system was eliminated by the same president who, at the age of 20 years old in 1936, wrote the labor law of 1936 that established that system. He destroyed his own baby. And um, it was that, the labor reform of 1997 was written by a former communist, a former socialist, he probably called himself a socialist. Yeah, he, he was still, he still considered himself a socialist, but obviously not a socialist. Uh, he was in the government. His name, somebody who I got to know pretty well, uh, and just passed away a couple of days ago, Teodoro Petkov. And, uh, what's that? He just died. That's sad. He did what? He just, he died. just, he just passed away. Yeah. Oh, you asked me that, or you? Yeah, okay. Yeah, I, I just, uh, yeah, he just died about four or five days ago. And uh, Petkoff, uh, interesting character, very interesting guy. But he, he, he wrote the reform that eliminated the system that had existed before, which the labor movement stated two or three years before that, that they were not willing to even discuss the change of uh, the reform that was being proposed. And they changed. The labor movement, the labor leaders, practically all of them, went along with the neoliberal reform. And Chavez, who was just beginning his campaign for the 1998 elections, um, was with the workers. He participated, I think he participated in a, in a very big march. Um, and um, I'll tell you, there was a real divide between the labor leadership that supported that reform and all the workers who were opposed to it, so that um, Chavez is elected. And the first thing he does is he puts a halt to the privatization. Aluminum was about to be privatized, and he put that on hold. The social security system was about to be privatized, he put that on hold. And then, after he was reelected for the third time in 2006, he nationalized those companies that had been turned over to foreign capital. He nationalized the telephone company from Verizon. He nationalized the steel company. He nationalized the electricity company. He nationalized the cement company. He took over the Bank of Venezuela. So this was something that explains not only why Chavez was elected in the first place, but why he maintained his popularity uh, throughout those years. Secondly, 
in 2001, he passed legislation that, in a sense, renationalized, let's say, partially nationalized the oil industry. Because that legislation in October of 2001 stated that all mixed companies involved in the primary exploitation of oil had to be more than 50% owned by the state. Previously, the process known as the oil opening, the apertura petrolera in the 1990s, the neoliberalism of the 1990s, similar to Mexico, it was a gradual privatization. And that reform, that law, known as the Ley Organica de Hidrocarburos, um, meant that all these companies were state controlled, state owned, in more than 50%. And at the same time, simultaneously, a land reform known as La Reforma, La Ley de Tierras, uh, basically stated that the private sector had certain rights, but also obligations. And one of the obligations was the exploitation of the land, and that idle land would be taken over. Uh, would be subject to state takeover. Um, now, in the past, in Venezuela, almost every time that a that a agrarian reform was promulgated, you had a coup. You had a coup in 1955. I'm sorry, 1945, when Medina Angarita, a very popular president passed a, uh, uh, was about to pass a, an agrarian reform that was written by his Secretary of Agriculture, Minister of Agriculture, Angel Biagini, who was going to be the next president of Venezuela. Well, you had a coup shortly after that. In 1948, same thing. Agrarian reform, President Romo Gallegos, famous novelist, he was overthrown just right after an agrarian reform was written. And Chavez, right after his agrarian reform was passed in October of 2001, you had a general strike, which is a misnomer because it wasn't a general strike. It was a general lockout because it wasn't the labor leaders who they supported. The traditional labor leaders supported it. But when you have a situation in which the, in which the workers go to work in the, 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 the gates are closed, the doors are closed, that's not a strike, that's a lockout. Mm -hmm. And it was the Chamber of Commerce of Venezuela, known as Fede Comunis, which really spearheaded that general strike in December, on December 10th, 2001. And on April 9th, 2002, the same thing happened. And then they called for the extension of that general strike on April 10th, and that led into the coup on April 11th. And who was the president for those two days before the poor people came down from the hills and Chavez was reinstalled as president? The Chamber of Commerce. The president of Venezuela was Pedro Carmona, who was the president of Fede Comunes. And the same thing happened seven or eight months later in December. You had a two-month general lockout. The same scenario, the labor leader said, you know, we're calling a strike, but it was the president of Fede Camas, this time Carlos Fernandez, who spearheaded that. And that failed. So this, kind, this uh, I think, gives you a background, firstly, as to why Chavez is, was so popular. And secondly, it helps explain why Maduro is so popular. Because even though this, the economic situation in Venezuela is very difficult, and that has a lot to do with the price of oil declining so rapidly um, from over $100 a barrel to a little over $30 a barrel. And that's inevitable. Venezuela is as dependent on oil as any country can be on their main uh, commodity, export commodity. Uh, oil exporting countries in the third world tend to be more dependent on oil than other countries are on their main exports. Uh, so that was inevitable. But 
In addition to that, Maduro has had to face an international environment quite different from that of Chavez. Because Chavez, during that period, you had these pink tide governments, which were progressive, some more than others, but you had Argentina, Uruguay, Brazil, Bolivia, Ecuador, uh, Nicaragua, then more recently El Salvador. Uh, all those countries were run by progressive governments, whereas Maduro faces a situation which is just the opposite, um, a governments that are aggressively opposed to the Maduro government. So in spite of that, uh, Maduro has not reversed Chavez's policies. He hasn't turned to neoliberalism. He hasn't privatized these companies that were taken over by Chavez. And so this partly explains the fact that the Chavistas have maintained power for this extended period of time. Um, now, the other development that explains the difficulties of the Maduro government is that under Chavez, as hostile as President Bush was and Obama was, at first it seemed like Obama was going to be friendly with Chavez. They met in Trinidad. Uh, Chavez gave him a copy of the Open Veins in Latin America by Eduardo Galeano. Remember, there was a front, the front page picture in the New York Times was the two of them embracing each other or shaking hands, I don't remember. And uh, it looked, you know, like things would be different, but they weren't. The deep state got to Obama, <laughs> and uh, uh, he was quite hostile to, to uh, Maduro. But in spite of that, uh, the, uh, Obama's uh, position, I, you know, on the one hand, um, Obama uh, set the stage for what uh, Trump is doing with that executive order. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, Obama didn't go as far as, as Trump because Trump has played an activist role in isolating Venezuela. <clears throat> Uh, Pence, uh, Tillerson, who began his Latin American tour, saying that sometimes it's necessary, talking about Venezuela, sometimes it's necessary for the military to step in. It was kind of a condescending statement. You know, in Latin America, you know, the people sometimes don't have their act together, you know, those people to the south. Um, so sometimes the military has to step in. Um, Rockefeller said this, Nelson Rockefeller said the same thing. Uh, on his, 19, I believe, 1970 tour, uh, which he was in Argentina and elsewhere, received a very uh, active reception of rejection. And he came back saying the same thing. And look at what happened subsequently. Uh, military dictatorships took over almost all the countries in Latin America. So that was Tillerson's statement. Haley, Nikki Haley, went to Colombia and said to the recently elected uh, President Ivan Duque, you are going to play a key role. You're going to play the key role, the most important role, in isolating the Venezuelan government. Mm -hmm. And uh, Mattis, James Mattis, Secretary of Defense, said the same thing in Brazil with regard to Temer. So this is an activist role, uh, mm -hmm. quite different from, from Obama, who set the stage but didn't go that far. But I think that of all the important members of the Trump administration, the one that has had the most nefarious effect is Mnuchin. Because what Mnuchin, Steve Mnuchin, has done has been to use the list of Venezuelans who are being sanctioned. That is. Uh, Trump has a list, and it, it keeps on, he keeps on placing more names on it, of Venezuelan, for the most part, government officials who are accused of corruption and money laundering and drug trafficking without any proof, no right to defense. And so their 
deposits, their millions of dollars that they have robbed from the Venezuelan people and have placed in Venezuelan banks. I know at least one person is laughing when I say these things sarcastically, because <laughs> this is what the what the Venezuela this is what Trump says that these thieves in Venezuela are depositing their millions of dollars in U.S. banks. I've got news for Trump. Maduro isn't that stupid. If he's robbing from the Venezuelan people, he's not going to be placing that money in you know, savings <laughs> accounts in the United States. <laughs> but th this is what Mnuchin is saying. Uh, Mnuchin and the people in the, the Secretary of Treasury is say are saying, we're going to find out I mean, practically quoting him word for word, we're going to find out where Maduro and Flores, Cecilia Flores, who is the, um, Cecilia Flores, who is the first lady, where they have their money, and we're going to fr freeze that money. Th then they talk about shell companies, they talk about front companies, which um, Maduro and his cronies are working through. Now, it's, you know, it's, it's laughable, but it's part of a, a, a really nefarious and very effective strategy because it creates an atmosphere in which U.S. companies are afraid to have anything to do with Venezuelans. Venezuelans, members of the government, Venezuelan business people who might be pro-government, and Venezuelan people, business people who are anti-government. But when the President of the United States says that, you know, there are people who have, you know, corrupt people in the Venezuelan government who have money in the United States, and we don't know where that money is, but we're going to track this down, and when we track it down, we're going to freeze this money, because that's what they say. Mm -hmm. We're going to freeze these funds. So what effect does that have? That makes financial institutions in the United States very reluctant to handle any money coming from Venezuela. But not only in the United States. Look at what's happening in the case of Iran. The sanctions just went into effect a couple of days ago. And already, Shell and Total, Total is the uh, or main, I think the biggest oil company in, in France. And even though the European Union countries are not in agreement with Trump's sanctions against Iran because they support the treaty that Obama signed with Iran. Nevertheless, these two companies have stated that they are not going to import oil from Iran because they don't want to have any retaliation against them. In other words, they are afraid that the United States, that Trump, may take measures against them if they don't respect Trump's sanctions against Iran. And not only that, SWIFT, a European financial institution, has stated, and you can look this up and you can Google SWIFT, Iran, sanctions, those three key words should um, uh, pull up the, the, the article, in which SWIFT says that they will not handle money from banks in our, Iran because we don't want, and I'm practically quoting what they say, we don't want to... Um, uh, create instability in the world financial system. In other words, European institutions are afraid to buck the Trump administration because they, they fear reprisals. So if this is affecting Iran, it's affecting Venezuela as well. Okay? Now, in addition to that, the sanctions explicitly state that the uh, U.S. financial institutions that nobody in the United States can purchase bonds from Venezuela. And like I say, you know, th this uh, executive order goes beyond U.S. borders because banks throughout the world are, you know, complying with this measure uh, uh, of the Trump administration. Venezuela is trying to refinance its debt. Any country does that, all countries do that, when they're facing economic difficulties. And because of the price of oil and because of other circumstances, including these sanctions and including the economic war, which is a term that the Maduro people use um, against Venezuela, uh, 
it's natural that Venezuela would try to refinance the public debt. Uh, but the Trump administration is making this extremely difficult. In addition to that, the Trump administration has prohibited the oil company Citgo, which is 100% owned by Venezuela. It was bought out by Venezuela in the 1980s. And now Citgo cannot repay, uh, can, cannot send profits back to the home country. So according to Joe Embersberger, who does good empirical study, I mean, he he's, writes on, on Venezuela, and uh, he does a lot of research and, you know, uh, pulls up, you know, a lot of facts, and he claims that over, that he claims that a billion dollars uh, of profits have not been sent back to Venezuela, that the Venezuelan government has been deprived of a billion dollars since this measure came, went into effect over a year ago. Um, so that these are some of the effects of the embargo. Now, I just want to, let's see, the time factor, we're, uh, we, we, we began at about 6.15, 6.20, so uh, it's been about 50 minutes, 45 minutes, and we want to open this up to um, discussion, debate, questions. So let, let me just end with this um, uh, statement. And that is that the uh, critics of the Chavista governments on the right use what's happening in Venezuela as proof that socialism doesn't work. What they don't say is that if socialism doesn't work, why every time a socialist government is established, going back to the Soviet Revolution of 1917, why do the big economic groups and why do the governments of the capitalist nations do everything possible to undermine those governments to create instability and military <coughs> intervention? That was the case with the Soviet Union. It was the case with China. I mean, after all, the United States didn't recognize China for all those years. Certainly the case with Cuba, with the invasion of the Bay of Pigs and all the attempts to uh, assassinate Castro and all the other instances of sabotage. <coughs> but also, it doesn't account for the fact that Venezuela isn't socialist. I mean, if socialism doesn't work, perhaps this demonstrates that capitalism doesn't work because 80% of the Venezuelan economy is capitalist. It's not socialist. The government is committed to socialism, but the economic system continues to be capitalistic. Um, but the argument of writers, both academic writers and analysts on the left, uh, basically they state, uh, just making a generalization, that they're opposed to the sanctions, they're certainly opposed to military intervention. If they're on the left side of the political spectrum, they're not going to support any of those measures. But their argument is that Venezuela and other so-called pink tide countries, the progressive countries like Argentina and Brazil, have not succeeded in breaking dependence on the basic commodities that those countries export. Uh, it's called the neo-extractivism thesis. It means that these countries are as dependent on extractivist commodities such as hydrocarbons, in the case of Bolivia, Ecuador, and Venezuela, soybeans, in the case of Argentina, and Brazil, and Uruguay, the, and, and Bolivia to a certain extent also, uh, that this dependence continues. And so these countries, these governments have been failures. Um, they're right with regard to this shortcoming, and it's one of the shortcomings. Uh, I am myself critical of certain aspects of these governments. If you see my publications, you'll see that, you know, I'm not a uh, 
hundred percent su supporter of Maduro. I've got my criticisms. Um, but I think that these writers who are on the left are committing two, two uh, errors. One is they fail to contextualize what is happening. They're critical and they're not in support of US military intervention and they wouldn't support the, the, uh, the um, attempts to overthrow Chavez, for instance, but they don't make the connection between this hostility, this campaign against the government, speaking specifically about Venezuela, but this can be applied to the other countries as well, that there's a relationship between this ongoing hostility and aggression on the part of a disloyal opposition in Venezuela. Because the political scientists who refer to uh, make a distinction between loyal and disloyal opposition, the disloyal opposition is the opposition that does not recognize the legitimacy of the government. And the Venezuelan opposition since 2001, since that legislation that I mentioned before of the agrarian reform and the oil legislation, has not recognized the legitimacy. They've tried to overthrow the government on several occasions. They've uh, promoted uh, demonstrations that have paralyzed you know, cities for four months in 2014 and 2017 that resulted in uh, com you know, uh, you know, confrontations. And um, there, was ex there were excesses of the security forces, but also uh, armed confrontations in which six National Guardsmen were killed in 2004. Imagine if that had happened in the United States. You know, a student at that university, the same student that I mentioned before, um, the Venezuelan student said, okay, six National Guardsmen were killed and one or two policemen in 2014. But that was retaliation. No, it was, uh, yeah, that, that was retaliation. That was the term that he used. The protest was retaliated. Well, here in the United States, if you have a, a demonstration, and let's say the police use tear, tear gas. I know all about that from the 1960s, the anti-war movement in the 60s and 70s. I mean, I saw that all the time. But let's say somebody pulled out a gun and shot a policeman. What would have happened? So this is what happened in 2014. In 2017, these demonstrators, who the New York Times compared with Martin Luther King, because the demonstrations were civil disobedience, and they compared uh, Leopoldo Lopez, the, um, the guy that, uh, the main leader of the demonstrations in 2014, with Martin Luther King. Well, Martin Luther King never paralyzed city, cities for four months at a time, building barricades, fires, placing big boulders on the, on, the, on the streets. None of those demonstrations, at least that I saw, were on sidewalks. They were all on the streets, paralyzing traffic. Uh, Almost all of them were paralyzing traffic. Once in a while, they'd let, you know, once in a while, they'd let cars, you know, go through. But, you know, that is what the Chavista governments have had to face, plus the support from the United States, plus the support of the church hierarchy, which has been completely in favor of the opposition, completely opposed to, to Chavez and now Maduro, uh, and the media. Uh, so that the uh, neo-extractivism thesis writers, the people on the left, some of them on the moderate left, others like Petrus, some of you pro have probably heard of James Petrus. James Petrus? Nobody said? Mm -hmm. Yeah. He is somebody who I admire a lot. He's been around for a long time. Uh, I was assigned one of his books as a graduate student at the University of New Mexico. With that, I demonstrate how young I am, because <laughs> he's still around. Uh, but uh, he writes you know, good stuff. But he's in this category that I'm referring to with regard to the neo extractivism writers. But they don't contextualize. Uh, they don't uh, demonstrate that there's a relationship between this ongoing hostility of an opposition that employs legal, semi-legal, and illegal means to undermine the government and to create instability, and 
some of the decisions that are mistaken, that you know, I would criticize, perhaps Petrus would criticize the same ones or others. But regardless of what those errors are, there's a relationship between the errors and the situation that's going on on the political and economic front. And secondly, these writers don't talk about the positive aspects of these governments, uh, for the most part, or they minimize the importance of the positive aspects. And I'll just briefly uh, talk about some of them. With regard to the social programs, it, Petrus, I, 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 I know this book because I reviewed it for the, the journal Science and Society. And uh, if, I re if I remember correctly, it was Petrus, uh, uh, the book by Petrus and uh, Veltmeier, Henry Veltmeier, uh, who say that the social programs have been successful and beneficial to the poor people because they distribute you know, certain benefits certain goods, certain services, to the poor people. So those programs are good. But what they don't say, and what should be emphasized, is that what's important about the social programs is that they incorporate the poor people in the decision-making process. There are, uh, uh, an, uh, uh, the official number is over 40,000 communal councils that were created by a law that was passed in 2006 that encouraged the creation of these. It was a proliferation of communal councils. And they receive funding. Firstly, they apply for funding on the basis of collective decision making, of assemblies in these communities. Uh, and then they solicit the funding. They oversee the carrying out of the public works projects. They insist on the hiring of workers from the community electricians, plumbers, bricklayers, etc. Uh, and they report you know, any discrepancy between the, uh, the um, project, the blueprint, and the work that's actually being carried out. So this is a participation process which uh, incorporates people, not only the working class, which always has organizational experience because these are people who belong to unions. They go to unions. There's a sense of discipline, both on the job as well as uh, an organizational discipline. But in the case of the marginalized sectors of the population, these are people who work in the informal economy. They don't have steady work. They're not protected by labor legislation. You know, they're basically street peddlers, or they're people who work for small companies that are not registered. So they don't qualify for the benefits of labor legislation. This block of people represent approximately 50% of the population throughout Latin America. So Chavez, when he said, I represent all people, and my job is to improve the conditions of all Venezuelans, middle class, upper middle class, business people, but my emphasis and my priority goes with the poor people. The middle class people in Venezuela hated that because here, you know, never before had a politician in power stated that, that the priority is with the poor people. Uh, and so th th this is one program that benefited not only the working class, but the marginalized sectors, which had never been taken into account before. Secondly, uh, what I already mentioned, the privatization uh, in the 1990s, the, in Venezuela and throughout Latin America, but specifically in the case of Venezuela, the state control of the strategic sectors of the economy was a goal of the political parties going way back in time, going back to, you know, Acción Democrática, which was originally somewhat of a leftist party, anti-communist, but somewhat le but, but on the left. Um, we were talking about that last night, uh, the, um, the, the, the book that you mentioned, Pap Papillon, uh, he, he, was, uh, he belonged to that party, he supported that party, which was progressive in the 1940s. That was one of their banners, state control of the strategic sectors of the economy. 
And that was incorporated in the Constitution of 1961, supported by COFE, Acción Democrática, the Communist Party. They all supported that. Well, Chavez comes along and he puts that to practice. So the people who are in this camp of the neo-extractivism writers um, who are somewhat on the left side of the political spectrum, they, they don't point that out. The progressiveness of the Chavista governments with regard to economic policy. Now, what the opposition says is these state companies have been poorly run. That's true. There's no question about it in, in a lot of cases. And that, and during the Q&A, if anybody wants me to go into that, I can you know, talk about that because there's an explanation behind that. But regardless, uh, the fact that these companies were taken over, that in itself is important. That is a point of reference in debate now um, so that uh, the importance, the significance of that action stands out by itself, regardless of how those companies have been managed since then. It's something similar to the uh, nationalization of oil, the oil industry by Cardenas, Lázaro Cardenas in 1938. Everybody knows in Mexico that Pemex has been poorly managed, but that doesn't detract from the importance of the nationalization of oil in 1938. Um, and then finally, I'll just mention one last aspect, and that is foreign policy. And there's no downside with regard to foreign policy, as there is with economic policy and the social programs. You could talk about the pluses and minuses. But with regard to foreign policy, uh, that has been progressive. Chavez announced when he was elected president in 1998 that he was going to promote this concept of a multipolar world. That meant that it was really a euphemism for anti-imperialism. He didn't use the term anti-imperialism until later. But multipolar world meant that it was a corrective to the unipolar world in which the United States controls everything. Well, the multipolar world meant that countries would uh, organize in different blocks uh, based on common interests, based on geography. So the Asians would have their blocks. The uh, OPEC was another example of a block of nations. Uh, Venezuela began to play a more uh, assertive role in OPEC, which traditionally uh, Venezuela was kind of like a, a mediator between the Arab nations, who were the conservatives, uh, and the more radical nations like Algeria, Iraq, Iran, uh, which uh, favored increasing the price of oil, and Venezuela was in the center. Where with, with Chavez, that changed. And Ch Venezuela became very assertive. Uh, Venezuela had a lot to do with the increase in the price of oil, which had been quite depressed during the previous two decades. So that this was a concept of a multipolar world that Chavez promoted, and that had a lot to do with the creation of different organizations of Latin American unity, beginning with UNESUR, uh, which took in the South American countries, which uh, resolved conflicts in Bolivia in 2009, when there was um, uh, a bloody confrontation uh, as a result of the passage of the Constitution at the time of the previous, around that time. Uh, in Ecuador, with the attempted overthrow and perhaps assassination of uh, Correa, uh, these, this was a, a role that the United States had previously played. Uh, CELAC, which is an organization of Latin American unity, promoting unity and integration. ALBA, which was, uh, began with an agreement between Fidel Castro and Chavez, and took in Ecuador, Bolivia, Venezuela, Nicaragua, and some of the um, Caribbean nations, two, two, I think two Caribbean nations. Um, so that this is really a plus, that these progressive writers who locate themselves on the left side of the political spectrum don't point out. So I believe that in order to be successful in solidarity work, in opposition to the sanctions and in opposition to a possible U.S. intervention in Venezuela, that it's necessary to point out 
the positive aspects, that it's not enough to say, well, I don't really care what's going on in Venezuela. My position is that the sanctions don't work or that the sanctions violate international law, which they do, because the United Nations uh, doesn't allow for unilateral sanctions. The sanctions against South Africa during the apartheid period were sanctions that were you know, approved by the United Nations. But um, it's not enough to say that, because if you really believe that the Venezuelan government under Maduro is just as bad as the opposition, if you take a plague on both your houses approach, in which you say, that, well, they're both bad, the opposition and the government are equally bad, uh, you're not going to sustain any effort. There are so many just causes out there that you're not going to really take much interest in this one. Uh, and the people that you're talking to, if they say, well, you know, Venezuela's a mess, it's all on account of Maduro, I mean, this is a narrative of the corporate media, and what are you going to say when people say, well, you know, you know I, I hope that these sanctions take effect because Maduro has caused so much harm. Uh, the fact of the matter is that there are two responses to that. One is context. Sure, there's a difficult economic situation. And I would add, Maduro has made mistakes, but these sanctions have a lot to do with that. And in addition to that, the Venezuelan opposition has been a disloyal opposition. You have the Chamber of Commerce who have practically, who practically declared war on the Chavez government. Then they modified somewhat their, their narrative, but they have been hostile to the Chavez government and the Maduro government since then. So that's point number one. Uh, and point number two is that there have been breakthroughs. Uh, there have been successes. There have been positive aspects of the Chavez and Maduro government. And one of them is something that could be applied to, to the United States. The Constitution of Venezuela of 1999 states, stipulates, that with enough signatures on a petition, uh, people can uh, call for referendums and recall elections at the national level. We have them in some states, here in Washington, I believe, certainly in, in, uh, in California, in my state of Connecticut, but you don't have them at the national level. If we had referendums at the national level, I mean, we could have a referendum about uh, maintaining troops in Afghanistan or a single-payer health program. And if we had recall elections, we could get rid of, we wouldn't have to wait until 2020. <laughs> so uh, that was in the Constitution, and that has been used. There have been referendums, one of them the Chavez has lost in 2007. And there's also been a recall election that Chavez won in 2004. So that these are positive aspects of the Chavista governments that have to be brought out in any conversation with regard to the sanctions and the threat of military intervention. Thank you. So now we want to entertain questions. Yeah, go ahead. Sir. Yeah, the corporate media in the first paragraph always throws out uh, the refugees and pressure on neighboring countries and political prisoners. Could you talk a little more about that? Yeah. Yeah, um, you know, firstly, they, they conflate political prisoners uh, with prisoners, pris prisoners in general. So they're really two different, two different issues. The problem with the uh, massive immigration, although that, that's also o overstated, but there is substantial immigration. There's no question about that because of the difficult economic situation. I mean, you've got hyperinflation, which is extremely difficult. Uh, under hyperinflation, you can't save because uh, inflation erodes your purchasing power. People have to uh, purchase goods as soon as they get paid. They can't wait more than a couple of days. Uh, so they purchase what they need for the whole quincena. People get paid on the basis of fortnights. So you purchase everything that you need for two weeks. Um, uh, and the erosion of, per of the purchasing power of the, of the uh, salaries that people have. Um, so there is massive immigration. But that issue has been politicized. And the fact of the matter is 
that according to the United Nations, uh, there have been there are 2.6 million uh, um, Venezuelans who have emigrated, but there are 5 million Colombians in Venezuela because of the situation in Colombia with the violence uh, and everything else that goes on in Colombia. Economic reasons and also because of the violence. And nobody politicized that issue. But with regard to the political prisoners, I just mentioned the case of Leopoldo Lopez. Lopez led the protests of 2014 that lasted, as I said before, four months. And you had uh, you know, entire cities or entire areas of different cities paralyzed completely. Uh, and Leopoldo Lopez uh, used the slogan, uh, Salida Ya, which means regime change now. He later dropped the word Ya, but you know, regime change. And he stated on TV, everybody heard it, that the protests would continue until Maduro was removed. People were getting killed every day. Six National Guardsmen and one or two policemen were getting killed. And he said day after day, this, these protests are going to continue. So he, he was jailed, and he received a 13, over 13-year 13 sentence. Um, just to give an example, I'd like to point out the uh, misleading statements of the media, and specifically the New York Times, which you know, people expect more from than, you know, say, Fox News. But the New York Times compared Le Leopoldo Lopez with Martin Luther King. And they stated, along with other, I, I don't remember the uh, newspapers, but you know, these, I, I, the newspapers that I read are, you know, are, are leading perhaps the Washington Post, New York Times, I don't remember, that um, Leopoldo Lopez was in jail, and they gave him, they allowed him to go to to be under house arrest, so he's now at home. But the condition was that he not make statements, just like he couldn't from jail. As a matter of fact, house arrest means basically that you don't have any rights. I mean, you, you, you've got the same rights that you have in jail. Uh, and so he was making political statements, and he was sent back to prison. Well, the, new, the newspaper article that I read, probably the New York Times, because that's a newspaper that I read every day, said, um, that he was um, taken from his house and placed in jail. It didn't say that he was under house arrest. It looked like you know they just showed up at his house, took him, and threw him off to jail. Um, but that that was that was temporary. He's he's now under house arrest. The opposition uses the term liberation of political prisoners, and you get the definite impression that they're talking about everybody who has been arrested as a result of these more recent protests. What they don't do is make a distinction. All those protests were illegal because, as I said before, they involved barricades, blocking traffic, and everything else. You know, here in the United States, civil disobedience means you go to jail, and you know you're going to go to jail. And that's, you know, accepted. The protesters aren't complaining about the fact that they go to jail. They go to jail, and that's the price that they pay plus the fine in order to make their statement. And in the best of cases, and I've seen this in New Haven, you know, the protesters sit down with the police beforehand, and they know exactly what's going to happen. They're going to go to jail, they're going to pay their fine and everything else. Um, sometimes it's not that, you know. But in this case, that it, one particular case that I know, it was a win-win situation. They both reached that agreement beforehand. Well, in Venezuela, that's not the case. You know, these are people who are being, you know, uh, unjustly uh, in jail. So, I, I would support a slogan of free the, the those prisoners who were nonviolent, because you had violence as well. As I said before, in in the 2017 protests, the protesters at nighttime were uh, paramilitary type. Uh, uh, dressed. They, they had uh, gloves, they had helmets, th th and they had an organizational uh, appearance like any paramilitary group. Uh, is this in the States or is it in Venezuela? No, I'm talking about Venezuela in, in 2017. In 2014, not, not so much so. Uh, 
But in 2017, uh, it was much, they, they used more uh, mobility. They fired upon an Air Force base in Caracas. They went up to the gates and they fired into the Air Force base in Carlota, which is a air, airport in, in Caracas. So that if the opposition stated some of these prisoners were involved in nonviolent protests and others were involved in violent protests, we're calling on the government to liberate those protesters who were not engaged in violence. That would be a slogan that I myself would support. But by saying freedom for political prisoners, they're obviously talking about all of them and not making a distinction between the violent ones and the nonviolent ones. Yes? Um, why, uh, without getting, I know that other folks want to ask questions, but um, without getting too deep into it, I would like to just know your perspective on two things. One, why didn't Chavez do more to diversify the, Amer the Venezuelan economy while he was in power? Yeah. And my second one is, how do we, how do we explain um, Chavez's children, Maduro's children, uh, spending, you know, having lavish lifestyles in uh, countries like New Zealand or Australia or Europe um, while the country grows? Um, <coughs> okay. <coughs> With regard to your first question, which is a good one, what, why didn't Chavez do more to diversify the economy? From the very beginning, from the uh, campaign that really lasted almost two years, Chavez emphasized the social aspect. Uh, one of his slogans was uh, the social debt, la deuda social which is something like reparations here in the United States for African Americans. Um, and there is a political explanation behind the emphasis on the social aspect over the economic aspect. And that is that the opposition, as I said before, was a disloyal opposition. Maybe they weren't so disloyal in the first two years, but it was obvious that they were moving in that direction. Had Chavez emphasized economic diversification and had less resources for the social programs, when Chavez was unjustly overthrown, after all, he had been elected in 1998 with 56% of the vote. Here in the United States, that's considered almost a landslide. And re-elected in 2000, because the Constitution was ratified and then new elections took place for all positions. And he was re-elected with 58% of the vote. So he was overthrown in spite of the fact that he was elected. And in spite of the fact that, you know, there was no justification at all for him being overthrown, none at all. If he had emphasized the economic aspect of diversification, it may have been that the poor people who supported him would not have come down from the hills. I say come down from the hills. That's where the poor people live. What's that? They literally did. They literally did. I say the, the hills because in Caracas, that, Caracas is a valley, so the poor people, some of the valleys are really for the, for the rich, like uh, 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 Monte, Colinas de Bayer Monte, huh? But most of, the valley, most of the hills are where the poor people live. They literally, like you say, came down from the hills. They would have supported him, but maybe they would not have put their lives on the line. You know, And this got no publicity in the press. There were a lot of poor people who were demonstrating for Chavez after the coup who were killed. You know, The justification for the coup was that uh, 17 or 18 people were killed, and they blamed it on the Chavises. Ari, uh, 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 what was his name? Fle Fle uh, Fle Fleischman. Fleischer. Fleischer. Harry Fleischer, who was the uh, spokes spokesman for the for the White House, said that Chavez was responsible, and they knew. There's a book by Ava Golinger, in which she, in the appendage of the of the book, publishes documents that are highly redacted. You just kind of figure 
if what you read in those documents of the CIA mm -hmm. demonstrates that the United States government knew all about the Cuban, the, the part that's blocked out that you can't read, what do they say? <laughs> no, I mean, that, that's, and that's true not only with these documents, that's true with all, all the documents mm -hmm. that, you know, the right, for, the right of Information Act, you can, you can read and you wonder those parts that are, that are blocked out, what do they say? But in any case, if Chavez had uh, not emphasized the social programs at a time when the price of oil was quite low, he might not have returned to power at the time of the coup. So this was his emphasis. Now, I criticize Chavez, as I said before, I'm, I'm critical. And one of the things I criticize about, about Chavez and Maduro is that there are moments which, in which the Chavistas had the upper hand vis-a-vis -vis the opposition. And they could have done things which they could not have done like now when Maduro is up against the wall. But when you got the upper hand, you can deepen the process of change. You can democratize your own internal party and your internal structure. You can fight against corruption. Um, uh, and you can carry out unpopular decisions, such as increasing the price of gasoline. So there are a number of things you can do that you can't do when the opposition is, uh, you know, calling protests and supported by the United States, and you've got Trump that's just waiting for an excuse to invade. So Chavez took advantage of those favorable moments, but I think he could have done more. Uh, and one of the things that, that I think he should have done is from the very outset, he should have emphasized more the need for what, exactly what you're saying, economic diversification. Um, for instance, Chavez in the referendum which was not ratified, <clears throat> one of the, uh, one of the uh, proposed reforms of the Constitution was reducing the work week to th 36 hours uh, a week. It was 44 hours. So reducing from 44 hours to 36 hours. Now that would, would be great here in the United States. We have a situation, you know, reducing the work week is the only way out of the economic situation in developed countries. I mean, the, with the overproduction due to technology, the only solution to unemployment and artificial employment is reducing the work week. I mean, the productive capacity of companies in the United States has increased tenfold, fifteenfold, twentyfold with computers, internet, and everything else. The only solution is reducing the work week. But in the third world country, it's a different story. And I think that that might have created a feeling among Venezuelans that the revolution is going to be hunky-dory. Everybody's going to live better, and there's not going to be any sacrifices. That's, that's what I believe that Chavez, when he talked of the sea of happiness, El Mar de Felicidad. You seem to know a lot about Venezuela. Do you remember that? Yeah. yeah. Do you remember that, that slogan, Mar de Felicidad? Well, he used that a lot. And I think, so I think that that was a mistake on the part of, of Chavez, not preparing people. Uh, and, and Maduro, I think, uh, commits similar errors. Um, but th that's my, my response to your first question. Uh, the emphasis was on social programs, not economic um, uh, diversification and production. And it had a political uh, explanation, there was a political strategy behind that. With regard to your second question, why does Chavez have his, his family members living, you know, high in the hog throughout the world? Um, and did you mention Maduro also? Yeah. yeah. Okay. I'll say this. Uh, I can tell you that what you read in the social networks, the, 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 the social media, is 99.9% .9 unreliable. And I'm really being nice, because it's more than that. 
I mean, I can go into a lot of detail. I can give you all the examples in the world. So the, these situations in which um, the children of Chavez and Maduro uh, are, are, are living these, these kinds of li uh, lives, um, I don't know. I'm not going to say it's false, because when I, I don't know, I, I, I say, I don't know. Uh, I'm not going to say it's false. But I am very skeptical, okay? Not, I'm not discarding the possibility, but I'm very skeptical because that information comes from the, from the, inter, from the uh, social media. It comes from the social media, and that's completely relevant. And I'll just give you one example that you probably know about. About two months ago, uh, Maduro, in his international travels, uh, went to Turkey. And one of the things he did in Turkey was to go to a famous restaurant. You remember, the, you remember the guy's name? I don't, I don't remember his name. But he's, he's very well known. He's a, a chef, a very famous chef. And he's got a so, social, um, he's got a blog or a web page that has something like uh, 10 million followers. And so Maduro went there and had a very sumptuous uh, dinner. And he was photographed with his chef and everything else. The opposition, Marco Rubio, here in, the, in Florida, called on Venezuelans to picket outside this guy's restaurant in Miami. You know, we, we know what, uh, what um, uh, what's it called, uh, dosing, uh, dosing? You know, when, when they, oh, doxing. doxing. When they uh, circulate information, the identification information of people. I mean, that 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 was the, the, the same thing. You know, people are saying that Trump's discourse led to the what happened in the synagogue, the synagogue in in Pittsburgh. Somebody makes a statement, and there are a lot of nutty people out there who take that statement to its logical conclusion. But the point is that. Maduro was heavily, very heavily criticized for that photograph. And the opposition, and some of the people who support Chavez, I, mean, I heard it, some of the people who support Chavez said, you know, why is he doing that? Uh, here, people in Venezuela are facing a very acute uh, crisis. A lot of people are unable to, to eat as much as they did before. Some people are losing weight. Some people are only able to eat twice a day instead of three times a day, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So here he goes to this sumptuous, famous restaurant, and he's photographed next to the chef, having a good time and eating a good meal. But there was a reason for that. The reason for that is that there is an international campaign demonstrating that Venezuela is completely isolated, demonstrating that Maduro doesn't have any friends, that everybody, you know, repudiates the Maduro administration and everything that it's doing. And Maduro does everything possible to demonstrate we have friends. I mean, that's his narrative. The Chinese are friends of ours, the Russians, now Turkey. They even mentioned uh, Egypt, which, uh, you know, I would rather not be. But, you know, that's, that's, okay. that's a legitimate that you have friends. And, and, and there are other, a lot of other countries that are friends, friends also. But he, I, I believe, I don't know this for a fact, but I believe that that was the strategy. He was trying to demonstrate. And this guy had, you know, 10 million followers or friends, um, so he was demonstrating something. But the social media, you know, just everything on the social media was, you know, Maduro and all the words that you can think of and all the hate things that you can think of, that Maduro doesn't care about the Venezuelan people, he's eating well, and the people are starving, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I am highly skeptical about what you read on the media. And with regard to Maduro's kids and with regard to... Um, uh, Chavez's uh, daughters, uh, we don't hear much about Hugo, his son, but with regard to them, I, I really can't say that I have inf direct information about, about their personal lives. Could you comment about the hypocrisy of the opposition because they say that they are the angels of the human rights in Venezuela? Could you comment about the sure. Orlando history and maybe other histories? Is Orlando? Uh, Figueroa. Figueroa, yeah. right. 
Yeah. That is a clear example how they are not fighting for human rights. They, oh, to, I don't they are brutal. That yeah. What's that? I don't believe them for a second. Uh, either. I mean, I no, I'm not. Right. Yeah. No, that, yeah. yeah, right. Do, do you know the case of Orlando Figueroa? Yeah. Well, okay. What um, Ricardo is referring to is an incident that took place uh, during the protests in 2017, in which there was a you know, fairly large protest. And all of a sudden, you saw, because this was filmed from a building someplace, that they poured gasoline over one of the protesters, one of the people who were in the protest. They lit, lit him on fire. Everybody went running off, including him. He survived four days. And uh, he said from his hospital bed that they did this because they perceived that he was a Chavista. When he died, his mother said the same thing. The opposition went into uh, uh, damage control mode and stated that this happened because this guy was a thief. The New York Times published an article in which, you know, it was an article on something else, but they mentioned this incident and they criticized it as they had to. I mean, they should have, because if this guy was a thief, you know, it, you can't justify him being killed because he was a thief. But the fact of the matter is that that explanation was completely unconvincing because in Venezuela, and I'm sure you're in agreement with me on this, that kind of thing doesn't happen. People don't kill thieves. And certainly on a demonstration, they're not going to kill a thief. They're thinking of something else. They're thinking of politics. They might punch the guy in the mouth, but they're not going to kill him. So the New York Times published an article of this incident and just gave the explanation, the version of the opposition. He was killed because he was a thief. They didn't present the explanation of Orlando Figueroa himself and his mother. Why didn't they? Why didn't they present both sides of the story as they're obliged to? by journalist ethics. They didn't because if they had published the truth about what happened, the opposition would have lost all its respect and support in the United States. Here in the United States, we're very sensitive to hate crimes. That was a hate crime. They did that because he was a Chavista, and I may add that he was a person of color. He wasn't an African Venezuelan, but he was a a person of color. And, and these people who were protesting were middle class people. All the, the protests didn't penetrate the barrios. They, these protests took place in middle class areas. Uh, in 2014, they took place almost exclusively, with just a few exceptions, in the municipalities of the middle class and upper middle class run by the opposition. In 2017, it was the same thing. But they did spread to municipalities of the Chavistas, but the middle class areas, OK? So these were you know, mainly whiter people. This guy was a, a person of color. Uh, and that was another aspect of what happened to him. But with regard to human rights in general, uh, I'm not, you know, I said before, if I'm not sure of something, I don't, you know, I'm not stuck in a paradigm. And I'm not justifying everything that the government does. And I can go into specifics, if, if anybody wants me to, of things that the Maduro government has done that I criticize with regard to um, democracy. There's no question about it. But the point of the matter is, as Ricardo, who uh, you know full well in the case of Mexico, but in the case of other countries as well, uh, in Mexico, uh, you have journalists who have been killed, um, you know, a record, you know, an incredible number. Perhaps you have the statistics, the number of journalists who have been killed. Journalists are not killed in Venezuela. In uh, the, the case of the um, 43 students who were killed and, and, and so many others, uh, the, the they, were, they were disappeared. In Venezuela, you don't have people who disappear. There's accusations of police brutality and, 
people who are unjustly jailed, and I'm not saying there aren't, because I don't know. But nobody's talking about people who have, who have disappeared. In Colombia, I went to a meeting in, in Great Britain a long time ago, it was 2005, and it was sponsored by trade unions. And they were very concerned, and they told me that out of five trade unionists who have been killed, who have been assassinated in the world, four out of five are from Colombia. So Colombia is now one of the countries that are, is concerned with the violation of human rights in Venezuela. That's a joke. But so it seems to me that, you know, it's like anti-Semitism as well. When the state of Israel accuses people of being anti-Semitic when they're not, when they're criticizing Israel, but not out of anti-Semitism, it's like the boy that cries wolf. I mean, it does uh, a disservice uh, to the cause of fighting anti-Semitism. And the same thing with what's going on in Venezuela, when countries like Colombia and Mexico and other countries talk about the, and, and let, alone, let alone the Trump administration, uh, as well as now Brazil, with the election of Bolsonaro, who I might, I might add, that b when Bolsonaro was elected president, the leading members of the opposition in Venezuela not only congratulated him, which we can justify, because the Venezuelan government also, as a matter of courtesy, you know, wrote a, 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 a statement of congratulations and said that we hope that we can, you know, improve relations, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's understandable. But the Venezuelan opposition said, we, we, we call on you to join the measures to isolate Venezuela, et cetera, et cetera, and to bring about regime change in Venezuela. Um, so that it seems to me that this campaign uh, with regard to the violation of human rights in Venezuela, it may be that some of the accusations are true. And it may be that these things, you know, should be pointed out and exposed. But by doing it in this way and calling for sanctions and losing all perspective in terms of the degree to which there's violation of human rights in Venezuela and the degree to which there are violations of democratic norms by calling Venezuela a dictatorship, uh, the attempt to improve democracy throughout the world and the attempt to fight against violation of human rights um, is discredited. So we have, we only got less than five minutes. Okay. I'm suggesting that we have, I don't know if we can have a discussion in five minutes, but let's see if we can broaden it a little bit. Okay. Five minutes. Anybody have a comment? Yes. Yes, thank you very much for the presentation sure. of Gladly's Full House. Um, just to be uh, brief, I think um, uh, there, what all of us can be a part of that are here tonight, we all know people, we all should be talking to, things are very dire in Venezuela. Mm -hmm. The first time I was there was 2005 for the youth festival, last time I was there was about a year and a half ago, and you can see the difference. Oh, yeah. Uh, read in the paper today, Wall Street Journal, the inflation is 833,000%. Um, um, uh, is, you know, and, and, and these sanctions affect working people the most, you know, working class. And uh, I think it's, it helps us understand better, rather than left and right and all this, but it is, yes, the native capitalist class as well as the imperialist, you know, um, U.S., Spanish, etc. And, um, uh, and and we should talk to our organizations, to our friends, to our coworkers, our classmates um, about what is happening and the need for solidarity because they're, they're tightening the screws. And um, you know, bottom line is, uh, uh, and, and by the way, that was uh, an open um, and friendly debate between Chavez and Fidel Castro in Cuba. Um, and Fidel posed the need for taking power and Chavez, uh, you know, and other, uh, the other Chavez, Chavez, many, were opposed to that. And that was the difference, but when, they were when, able to work together. When was he opposed to that? Chavez was Chavez. opposed to taking power? Yeah, of, of making a revolution for the working class. Oh, the working class, right. yes. Right, yes. right. Uh, which you um, uh, reminded me of by some comment you made earlier. Yeah. yeah, with regard to the marginalized sectors of the population. But, Chavez was skeptical about the working class. 
uh, before he came to power. Yeah. But um, uh, anyways, I forget what made me think of. It. But but yeah, it was open. They were able to work together and stuff. And you know, they got sanctions on on Cuba. And, but we should be opposed to all those sanctions because it always affects working, you know, whether it's Iran or North Korea or wherever it is. Um, and uh, we should be talking to our unions too, by the way. Uh, and I would just, in my opinion, I think bottom line, you know, even though it's a radically different situation in Venezuela, um, and, and, but bottom line, I think we face similar things here. We're oppressed by capitalist class and, you know, to organize ourselves and, and to unite and fight and build a movement and, and overthrow that. And by the way, uh, you mentioned uh, Ava Golinger. I was going to make a, a little plug for this. Look, she's actually part of a debate. This, this was the center of, the, of a uh, debate they had at the Caracas Book Fair. I remember if it was over one or two years. But if socialist revolution is possible, I mean, it was on, in the U.S., but still, if it's not possible here, where is it possible? So, um, anyways, that's uh, taking up my time. Thank you. Thank you. It's possible what? here. <laughs> one, more com one more comment. Somebody? You want, so, did you have your hand up? No? <laughs> okay. One more comment. No more comments. Let's give Dr. Steve. Good Ste evening. Yeah. 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 Thank you.